Hello everyone, welcome to Design Hub. In Design Hub, we provide quality technical content related to the design industry using practical concepts. So, to upgrade yourself please subscribe to the channel and press the notification bell to get notified every time we drop a new video. In this video, we will do a curved beam analysis, and learn about a von Mises failure criterion. First, let's see the problem statement and make the required assumption for the study. The problem statement of this study is to determine stresses at section AA of the curved beam. Similar to what we saw in the CAM and follower analysis, when translations in the X, Y, and Z directions and rotations about the X, Y, and Z axes are taken to be zero, the real fixed end condition in this context is comparable to the cantilever beam end condition. But keep in mind that fixture types in SOLIDWORKS simulation also depend on the kind of element to which they are applied, as was mentioned in previous videos. The movable restrictions are utilized as a result because solid tetrahedral elements are used to model the curved beam. Numerous mechanical elements occur in the shape of initially curved beams. Examples include C-clamps, punch press frames, crane hooks, and bicycle caliper brakes, to name a few. This example examines stress at section AA shown. For cases such as this, where applied load, F, acts to one side of the cross-section under consideration. Classical equations calculate bending moment, M equals F multiplied by L, about the centroidal axis, not the neutral axis, at that location. Reaction force, R equals to F is also applied here. Accordingly, classical equations for stress in a curved beam can be used to predict stress at section AA. In this example, the validity of this assumption is investigated while exploring additional capabilities of SOLIDWORKS simulation software. Now, the strategy for this problem will be generating a high-quality standard mesh with default mesh density. Also, we will be using Jacobian 4 points mesh. Now, let's see about the stages of finite element analysis. The basic method of finite element analysis can be divided into three stages. Pre-processing for modeling data preparation. Processing for equation construction and solution, and post-processing for analysis result visualization. Pre-processing refers to the process of preparing input data for finite element analysis. In this phase, the geometry of the finite element model is established. The model is also subject to the various situations and features like generation of finite element mesh, assigning the material, assigning boundary conditions, assigning load conditions, node number and element number and size. The foundation of finite element analysis is processing. At this stage, the finite element equations are put together and solved, yielding the analysis results. The computer manages this computational process automatically, although user input is still necessary. The computation is performed in the order listed below. First it will perform calculations of equivalent nodal forces and element stiffness matrix. Then assembling add and solving the compiled equations. And finally recovery and smoothing of secondary variables. Post-processing is the stage where the analytic results are graphically shown and presented in more comprehensible formats. Further modification or processing of analysis results. Visualizing the results of the analysis, managing different outputs. Handling outputs. The first step we will follow is to make the curved beam in SOLIDWORKS according to this figure, or you can download this file from GrabCAD. And you can start the study by going into simulation and creating a new study. Before you start with the analysis process, it is important to set the units for SOLIDWORKS simulation. Set the default unit according to your preference. We will see the model of curved beam and its dimensions in the SOLIDWORKS. Step 3 is assigning a material. 
Choosing a material is a phase in the design of any physical thing. The material used for curved beam is 2014 aluminum alloy. Firstly, it is one of the strongest commercially available aluminum alloys. Secondly, aluminum 2014 alloy is extensively employed in the aerospace sector. Heat treatment and annealing are further applications. 2014 aluminium comes in a variety of forms and tempers. Aluminum alloys have strong corrosion resistance characteristics and high electrical conductivity. When these alloys are subjected to low temperatures, their strength increases, and when they are exposed to high temperatures, their strength decreases. Alloys made of aluminium perform well at low temperatures but are fragile at temperatures above 200 to 250 degrees Celsius. The yield strength is 96 megapascals. An ultimate tensile strength ranges from 190 to 500 megapascals. The Brunel hardness is 135. Truck frames and aircraft structures are made using aluminum 2014 alloy. Step 4 is applying the load to the model. Before assigning load conditions to the model we will insert split line. For that, we will place a reference plane at 2.25 inches from the top plane of the model. You can access this from the features section under reference geometry. Afterwards, under curves, select the split line and create an intersection type of split in the model. The presumption of pin loading enables us to examine the application of a split line to isolate a region of the hole's bottom surface where contact with a pin is anticipated to happen. A pin force would be transferred to the curved beam model on this surface. First, select the splitting bodies, planes or faces. Here, we will select the reference plane. And now select bodies or faces to split. Here, we will select the whole surface. Now the surface of the hole is created into two parts. The precise contact area depends on several variables, including dimensions of the contacting components, material characteristics and, the strength of the force pressing the two surfaces together. We have made a random assumption about the area under load. So, that the insertion of a split line can be demonstrated. Determination of true contact area includes a pin model, and use of contact and gap analysis but for now, we are concentrating on stresses at section AA. Now, we will assign load conditions, and fixtures. It's crucial to remember that in this instance, the area intersected at the bottom of the hole was chosen at random. Arbitrarily, we assume that the pin is exerting a force of 3,800 pounds in the shown area. Select the surface, and edge to give the force its direction it must act in.
Step 5 is about generating a high-quality mesh. We will be using high-quality standard mesh in this study. Additionally, Jacobian 4 points mesh will be used. A variety of mesh information is displayed in the mesh details panel. Take note of the model's nodes and elements as you scroll down the list. As a result of the automatic mesh generating process, numbers may somewhat change. Turn the model to reveal the mesh's two element thickness. The minimal number of solid elements that should be employed is two across the thinnest dimension of the model. As a result, two elements are regarded as the unofficial dividing line between when to utilize solid or shell elements. So, for this model, either element type might be employed. However, keep in mind that thin components are often the only ones to use shell elements. The sixth step is to run the study after all the essential steps are performed. We will plot the graph of required stress. Now, we will display and analyze the results. This exercise investigates stress at the AA section. We will also plot the graph of von Mises stress. First, let's understand how can we anticipate failure. Predicting failure depends on the mechanical properties of the material, especially ductility and brittleness. First, we must establish what failure is. Failure is typically thought to start with plastic deformation in ductile materials. And with a fracture in brittle materials. These points are simple to identify for a uniaxial stress condition, such as a tensile test. They take place when the object's normal stress approaches the material's yield strength for ductile materials, or its ultimate strength for brittle materials. In general, brittle materials cannot be subjected to failure theories that are relevant to ductile materials, and vice versa. Because fundamentally, both ductile and brittle materials fail in different ways. So, what does a failure theory do? It's quite simple. It allows us to anticipate the failure of a material by comparing the stress state in the object. We are assessing with material properties that are easy to determine, like the yield or ultimate strengths of the material that we can obtain by performing a uniaxial test. Predicting failure is substantially more straightforward for uniaxial stress instance. But it is more difficult for a more complicated triaxial stress instance. In reality, it's so challenging to anticipate that there isn't a single approach that works everywhere. Instead, as we saw in the previous slide, 
we must select the best appropriate failure theory from a variety of theories that have been experimentally shown to function rather well in particular conditions. Principal stress is the highest or lowest typical stress that can develop on a loaded body. Here, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 are the three principal stresses. If we are talking about failure theories then one of the simplest theories is the Rankine theory, or maximum principal stress theory. It states that failure will occur when the maximum or minimum principal stresses reach the yield or ultimate strengths of the material. But this theory particularly doesn't work for a ductile material. Failure theories for ductile materials must take into account one important finding, namely that hydrostatic stresses do not result in yielding in ductile materials. A general triaxial stress state, such as the one depicted below, can be divided into stresses that alter volume. And stresses distorting the shape. Because they act on an object submerged in liquid, hydrostatic stresses are defined as stresses that result in a volume change. There are never any shear stresses in a hydrostatic stress setup, and the three main stresses are always equal. The hydrostatic component for a triaxial stress condition can be calculated as the sum of the three main stresses. The process by which ductile materials yield is known as shear deformation. In a state of hydrostatic stress, there are no shear stresses, hence this component can be quite big and still not contribute to yielding. Stresses alone that result in shape distortion are what induce yielding. These are referred to as deviatoric stresses. By deducting the hydrostatic component from each of the primary stresses, the deviatoric component is derived. For ductile material, Tresca failure criterion and von Mises failure criterion are the two most typical theories of failure. In forthcoming videos, we'll explore into this subject in great detail. Let's now concentrate on the von Mises theory. Richard von Mises created it at first, but several other people helped to refine it. Therefore, Maxwell Hubert Henke von Mises theory is also known as that. The von Mises theory states that a component fails when the object's maximum distortion energy per unit volume meets the yielding distortion energy per unit volume. This can happen when a component is loaded, biaxially or triaxially. The maximum distortion energy theory is another name for it. 